Messi. All right. Hey, Zachary. Hello. Hey. Hi there. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so, so can you can you tell us where you're from? I love your background. Where am I from? Well, it depends how I'm feeling. Sometimes I'm from New York and sometimes I'm from Chicago. Uh, <laughs> I was born in New York, but I went to high school and grew up mostly in Chicago. So I no, but where, where, where are you from right now? Like, I like your background. Oh, where am I physically located? I am. Oh, that's in... a better word. See, that's more analytical. <laughs> there you go. Straightforward there. I'm in Rhode Island. I am in a town called Warren, Rhode Island. Uh, well, Rhode Island is the smallest state, so the whole thing takes about 15 minutes to go across, but um, just outside of Providence. And so I'm sitting what, in Sprout Coworking, which is a coworking. Uh, what's that mean? What's Sprout Coworking mean? So it's a coworking business of which I actually am a part owner. Uh, oh, that's so that's, that's cool. on the side. That's why my bio says something about entrepreneur as opposed to compensation only. Uh, oh, <laughs> just one location, or are there more of them? So there are two locations. We have a larger location in Providence. We have a second location here in Warren, but we're just local to Rhode Island. Okay. Um, and co-working provides um, shared work and meeting space. And it's an increasingly important part of the world at work as we come out of COVID and remote work mm -hmm. becomes a big and bigger and bigger part of the way work gets done. So, so mm -hmm. let me ask you right now, is that uh, your office behind you or is that at your co-work place? It's a co-work, it's the co-working place. Wow, mm -hmm. how cool. Yeah. They even have a DVD and a Canon thing back there. I don't <laughs> think there's a DVD. That's just, there's a printer over there and there's some artwork. <laughs> so we have galleries in our co-working spaces with rotating shows. We're excited about being an art gallery as well as a co-working uh, space. So, I'm going to come visit you. Yeah. Come on down. We're ready for you. All right. <laughs> I was working with a co-working space, but it was just for women in um, West Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And it was so bougie and cute. Like the women loved coming because like you forgot you're in an office because it was of course like pink and like lots of decorations, but there was a cafe. There were these cute little meeting rooms. I was like, oh my gosh, like I need to join. I was like doing some work for them. Right. I was like, I just like, I loved the space and it was just such a vibe. But then yeah, with COVID, I think they, they shut it down altogether. So, but. so we managed to stay open through COVID, but at a very, very low level. And we're just now starting to see things come back up. That place in West Hollywood, you probably know my sister-in-law because I think she was involved in a women's co-working place in the area. The, the wing? <laughs> I think so. I think that might yeah. be what it was called. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> it was just every time I was there, I was like, and, and you know, because women, we love all the, the little niceties. So there was always mints like in the, the bathroom. There was always like hair care products. So it was like, I almost felt like going to an Equinox, but then you're like, oh yeah, I actually have to like open my laptop and do some work here as well. So it yeah. was quite nice. We found that food is definitely the way to a uh, customer's heart. We put Absolutely. candy out all the time. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, unless you're trying to do a genetics test and they put, pop a big old piece of chocolate in their mouth. Oh, yeah. Does, it, does that harm the test there, Char? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like we were handing out candy and then people were popping candy in their mouth and we were like, no, 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 you can't. We can't do a genetics test if you're going to pop candy in your mouth. <laughs> but anyway, that's cool. Yeah. Let's It'd I be cool to it. find some like healthy snacks. Like, what would you do for healthy snacks? What do you, well, you know, so we rotate all the time uh, what's available. And we have a kitchen, of course, coffee, tea, and so on and so forth in the co working space. And if a member or somebody does some baking, they bring it in and share it. Again, we tried to kind of shut that stuff down during COVID, um, but yeah. it'll be back again soon. But yeah, the, the dish of candy is. Wrapped, wrapped candy is pretty consistent. So yeah. yes, it's uh, unhealthy. I, I, you know what? I think that stuff, it may be unhealthy for your body, but it's very healthy for your soul. So it's important to eat yeah. candy. You That's know, right. I, have you ever <laughs> seen those perfectly teeny wrapped mints, like with all the little mm -hmm. colors? I, I just think that's super cute. Great <laughs> touch. <laughs> that is a nice All right. Yeah, I think co-working is, I think you're definitely right, Zachary, I mean, it's going to be so important. I mean, right now, everybody's working, you know, this sort of remote and working at home, but, but uh, I think that companies are going to start thinking about the workplace differently, uh, having more flexible options. I mean, there's people that are going to want to uh, not just work at 
in the, I guess we're going to talk about this next week with Patty, right? And it's in the, uh, it's not just the, the, uh, uh, the, the work location, but then there's all working at home and then, and then the in-between, which is, is you're traveling, you're, you need some, to do a webinar or have a conference call or whatever it may be, you need to have that those, a place with good, reliable internet, right? So I know that I Absolutely. use co-working places around the globe when I travel. So it's a, quite a yeah. We know that. <laughs> I, was, I was reading an article the other day about the future of commercial real estate, and it said something to the effect that in the United States, only 10% of commercial space has been used in the past year. Yeah. Wow. yeah. And, and actually, I do have a question, maybe Zachary, as a parking lot item. So I do. Um, we are Rocky Mount Health Advocates. So we have six malls. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to we're thinking about going in and strategically talking to the malls about like um, kind of beyond your traditional health center. But, you know, all those health um you know, really looking at the malls as more of a health resource, not just a gym, but like a health resource. Mm -hmm. So maybe we could talk later about it because I know we're okay. about to start. Sure. <laughs> Sign or slowly roll in. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that's a, uh, uh, those will, will locate, I can't believe that statistic you just mentioned, Zachary, about 10% of the of uh, real estate, commercial real estate being filled this last year, I mean, it's, it's shocking. You know, they're I know still that, paying uh, their rent. Most of most tenants are still paying the rent in commercial real estate. So yeah. there's a big concern in the industry that if the people aren't going to come back, what's going to happen? Yeah, so we'll see. Well, um, Sam and I had a had a, a project last year, and Sam, there is actually a video of all the employees in their cubicles. And I would assume if I was taking a picture of the same video of the same building, they're all not in their cubicles right. anymore. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we are at the top of the hour. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, get ready to broadcast here. So just one more. As I Hi, share my screen. On. Thank you for being here. We're going to get started in just a second. We'll just get, let Sam get a. Uh, all these slides together. Right. And we're not a real slide heavy kind of company. We are all about talking and chatting and sharing and communicating because all of us have separate talents. That's right. <laughs> okay. That's right. It's nice, to have, it's nice to be conversational, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's more interesting right, that good. way. You know, no one likes monotony. You know, that's boring. We shut off from that. <laughs> right. And I think most uh, executive leaders have heard all the old old you know you know mindset right so Jules, Jules you're you're awesome get us kicked off I'm 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 up I'm ready <laughs> all right okay. well, awesome, everyone uh so thank you for joining us here for a, another webinar of the people strategies forum. Um, I missed everyone last week, so it's nice to be back. Um, and if this is your very first time here, welcome. Uh, just to give you a quick rundown of what we do here, we try to help a little bit of everybody. And this webinar is really just a mastermind of leaders. And we're dedicated to creating workplaces where people thrive and where employers reward and customers love. So today we are going to be talking about global fair pay with Zachary Weinberger. So I'll introduce him in just a second. Uh, but if you aren't familiar with the forum, my name is Jules. I help kind of host and moderate this forum. And I will also be off to the side during this webinar. So I will be looking in the chat box. If you have any questions at all, uh, please drop them in there and we'll make sure we get them answered. But if you're not on the Zoom call and you're watching the replay, or maybe you're coming to us from one of our other streaming platforms, still be sure to leave those questions and we'll make sure we do get answered, those, those questions answered for you at the very end. So we won't forget about you. Uh, and then to introduce you to the rest of the panel, we have the lovely Shah here with us today. She not only works with comp team, but she has over 20 years of experience with HR. She is a talent management consultant and runs her own company, Rocky Mountain Health Advocates as well. And we also have Sam. I think Sam, you're still in Iceland, right? 
That's uh, that's right. Yep, still here. Going to get yep. ready to come back to the states in a in a week though. So. Oh no. Well, um, Sam, the other week Sam had sheep just walking past his door. So, so I, I wanted to ask if there were any more sheep. Um, oh, it was a goat, right? Yeah, they, they, that's right. They they come they they hang around here every once in a while. They might want. We'll see if we can see one during the uh, the presentation. I see one right. out of the window right now. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it's always good to change up your environment. You see something different. It keeps the variety. And it's right. either the sheep or we have the dogs barking in the background. So, hey, no worries. <laughs> We're all remote. It's very animal friendly here. Okay. <laughs> um, well, Sam, of course, is the founder and CEO of Comp Team. He's also the creator of the People Strategy Forum, and he is a reward strategist. So, all things compensation and talent management. Sam's the man. So I'm also going to introduce Zachary Weinberger, who is with us today speaking again about global fair pay. We're very excited to have him. He is the most ideal person to speak to us on this topic because he is the US head of greater.com, but he also has over 30 years of experience in total rewards. He not only has all that experience, but he has lived in North America, Latin America, and the Middle East. And he's worked with large corporations and other companies of various sizes in various industries. So he is, I, I know he's gonna have tons of expertise to share with us, tons of insights, and we're very excited to have him here. So Zachary, welcome Thank you, Jules. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. And we're excited to uh, hear from you today. I'm happy to be here. and. Very pleased to be part of the conversation. And I know this is a conversation, so I look forward to lots of questions and trying to give some answers and, and <clears throat> share a little bit of my experience. Um, I would just add quickly, in addition to the 30 years of experience in total rewards and working with organizations of different sizes and all around the world, um, it's complemented by um, a law degree and a master's uh, in a biz an MBA in finance. Um, I also have a master's in industrial labor relations. I love school a little, I don't say too much because I like it a lot. I got a lot out of it um, and have worked with large corporations and small organizations and feel comfortable answering questions of any kind um, around global fair pay uh, or anything to do with compensation. Although the emphasis and focus today is on global pay. So, so Zach, you were telling us that you, you you worked on just about every continent except for Antarctica, right? So you're you got quite a a breadth of knowledge there. That's true. I was the head of international compensation and benefits for Mastercard, and that put me on every continent where people use credit cards, <laughs> and I traveled extensively in that role. Um, I've also had other international responsibilities that required you know, learning a lot about the local fair pay and learning a lot about local culture and about what drives pay in countries all around the world, Europe, Asia, Africa, Latin America. Yeah, well, let's just dive into a little bit more. I mean, I know you have such a, you know, great experience in, in, in not just your professionally, but in your life and so forth. Can you tell us, let's just take us through the, the journey of, of how you got into to compensation and became a, a rewards uh, professional and and uh, the different company or companies you work with and, and around the world. Great, thanks, Sam. You know, I, like most people, when I was five or six, I looked into the future and I said, when I grow up, I want to be a compensation professional. <laughs> um, I, you know, serendipity takes a really big hand in where we all end up. And I started early in my career as an HR generalist. I felt that it was important to be able to help people. I mentioned that I have that degree in industrial and labor relations, and I went there because I felt that labor and management needed to communicate better uh, in order to, for everyone to benefit and that I could help facilitate uh, those better communications. And the place that I was working, which was the city of Stamford, Connecticut, um, in the then personnel department, had a retirement. The benefits manager retired, and I inherited his job. So that's how I got into compensation and benefits. Um, and from there, it was all uh, excitement and, you know, how exciting compensation yeah, can be. Yeah, that's right. Uh, um, I moved to Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Connecticut. Um, and then I went into, hmm, <laughs> into a company that was a diversified manufacturing company called Crane. And that was the beginning of my exposure to global compensation. Um, 
And from there, I spent several years working in Latin America for cable and wireless, which was a UK-based telecommunications company. Um, I was on a contract in, in Panama. It was a great experience. I am very glad that I had that, both for myself and my family. And I returned to the States again, working for diversified manufacturing. And I went from there into independent consulting. I did a lot of work for museums. I worked for the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. I worked for the Getty in LA. Um, I worked for the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So I really had a lot of fun with that. And then I got drafted back into corporate uh, life, working uh, with MasterCard, as I mentioned, the head of international compensation and benefits. Um, another stint uh, out in the world, more diversified manufacturing. And then for the past six years or so, I have been consulting independently, but for a little period in between, I worked as the head of compensation for Covidian, which was a $10 billion global medical products company, and spent a couple of years at State Street Bank uh, in the financial services industry um, as a head of business unit compensation. And, and these days, I help organizations of any size, one employee, 100 employees, 40,000 employees. That's great. Well, I, I'm so glad we're having this conversation. So finally, a little bit uh, uh, a topic near and dear to my heart is, is compensation and love of, of this field and, and rewards and, and, uh, and how to motivate and, and uh, you know, focus behaviors and so forth. It's, it's always a a great challenge to do this, especially in a global environment where we're dealing with different cultures, different uh, preferences and so forth. So, so uh, uh, really looking forward to the conversation today. Hello, can I say something? Yeah, go ahead, Char. Okay, Zachary, I absolutely love you and I don't even know you, so don't tell your wife. I'm just saying, <laughs> but um, I think the biggest challenge for the HR executives is when it comes to the overall competency of talent management strategy and understanding the numbers. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes us HR executives are hired as in the olden days, the HR, you know, the people people, right? But the problem is when you're sitting at the table with the executive team, they need to see a, see a strong correlation between the return on investment, the um, revenue aspect, and how it really ties the customer results and outcomes. Am I right? So my question for you is, have you worked on partnering with the quote people people to help the quote people people really understand how to articulate well with the executive team, but to be able to cross the, the results of comp a good compensation strategy with, um, with the financials or outcome strategy? So, Shar, I think you're absolutely right that HR has to be a business partner and understand the business. They have to be business minded. But at the same time, HR is the conscience of the organization and it has to advocate for the employees. And I think there's lots of empirical research, and this isn't compensation related, um, to show that if you take good care of your employees, your company will do well. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, compensation and compensation professionals as a part of HR really do have a very strong fiscal responsibility component to their role. It's the compensation organization's uh, responsibility to help the company understand how it's spending money on labor. Um, other people worry about where money is being spent uh, for operations, uh, but the compensation team has to help the organization manage its people budget. Um, and that's a compliment to many other things that are going on. Sam mm -hmm. talked about motivation and you're talking about that kind of need to think uh, with a business mindset and you absolutely have to think about things with a business mindset. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, you do need to pay fairly and competitively um, around the world. That's kind of the minimum starting point. And then you go from there. But if you believe that people come to work for their pay, that's rarely the case. Um, they come to work and expect to be paid fairly, but they come to work because they like the people they work with, or they like the organization that they work with, they like the challenges they get in their job. And if an organization is not providing those things, um, all the pay in the world isn't going to make enough of a difference. So I'm going to give you a beta company perspective, okay? Okay. So um, 
Sam did a um, compensation analysis for our company. Mm -hmm. And even Sam mentioned that we were probably going over his recommendations mm -hmm. for the quality of our employees. Um, but we appreciate the fact they gave us a, a compensation architecture that we could follow. Yep. And then we decided it's not just the number of widgets, quote, widget, widgets that we sell uh, or test actually with my company. Um, we are, we changed our name to what's called Rocky Mountain Health Advocates. So now we have to translate, you know, competencies, behaviors, talents, drives. And now we have to translate that to increasing our employees' salary rates. Now we have had a particular leader that um, I did not let go recently. She actually is a great producer, but her paperwork quality and some of that is not good. So um, it's very difficult, I think, in a fine balance because Bruce, or Bruce, well, yeah, whatever. Sam and I are yin and yang, and that's true for Sam. And I. So I like people, he likes numbers, he likes analytics. How do you help an, a typical HR leader, you know, embrace that? And then how do you coach them? How do you make that unicorn, as I call it, job that they appreciate the soft people skills and the number people skills? Does that make sense? So I think it makes sense. So first of all, just let me tell you a little bit of something about where I'm coming from. When I uh, was an undergraduate, I was studying computer science. And so I'm definitely a numbers person. In fact, my father and my son are both electrical engineers. Okay. Uh, somehow it skipped me. I'm an attorney. Uh, <laughs> but I'm also a compensation professional. Yeah. The reason I went into compensation is because computers were too boring. I needed to interact with people. And in compensation, you do get a chance to do that. But the same time that you're thinking about the people, you're also thinking about the numbers. But the most important thing, and I think this may go a little bit to the beginning to answer your question, Sharp, is that... Um, Compensation professionals, early in our careers, we think compensation is a science and maybe it's 20% art. And then when you get to the point that Sam and I are at, you realize it's the other way around. It's 20% science and 80% art. It's about using the technical tools that you have learned over the course of your career and applying them in creative and strategic ways. Um, so it really does become 80% art. And that goes to the point that you're raising. It is about that balance of numbers and I'm gonna say compassion might not be the right word, but be thoughtfulness about mm -hmm. the implications of the decisions that you're making. Yeah. Well, so how, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so if your question well, is, how do you teach people that? Um, well, here's the deal. I'll, yeah. I'll just be, I'll give you a candid, transparent example. Sure. So, and my employees know that I'm an advocate for them. So they don't care if I care, if I say so. So I took one of my employees out. She says Hispanic female, she's in her forties. And she said that she lear learned through one of her employees that her rate is way much lower than her colleagues rate and she said i'm bilingual i i do, i'm looking at my results um and we have some changes in our organization so we need to get her to be fair pay fairly fairly paid right yep. um but the conversation was hard because when when my ceo slash business partner established the rate um we saw during the last couple of months that their rate was not aligning 100% to their quality, right? So we're going to work with Sam and our, our experts just to realign and make sure that they're at what they're at. And we're using competency, uh, uh, passion, skill set, as well as our drives relative to our uh, sponsor, the TME method. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be more than just the number. It's going to be more than the widgets they sold. It's going to also be about if they can coach people, support people. So yeah, that's, what do you that, think about that? No, I think that's that's key, Shara, what you're talking about. Because, you know, it's like uh, Zach was talking about the, you know, the, the, you know, the compensation is not just about the numbers. It's about 
you know, how do we how do we use that for how do we apply that in a human humanitarian or humanistic type of way, right? So people are humans, and into what Zachary mentioned, they rarely come to work just for for pay. I mean, pay needs to be at a certain level, and then uh, beyond that, we need to be inspired by those things that we do and and so forth, which is you know part of the reason why we have a lot of this discussion. But getting pay right around the world is, is, is quite important, getting the levels right around the world, especially uh, when if we're operating out of a particular country, we're not familiar with other countries' rates and so forth. We need to figure this out. So, so Zachary, tell us the, 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 the first steps of, of uh, starting out a, a fair pay program on a global scale. I mean, what are the first things we need to look at? Right. So, I know, Sam, that's a great question. So over the years of my experience, one of the challenges that I face, and I think this is foundational to understanding how to get to fair pay globally, is that pay is very different in different countries around the world. And what's fair is different because it's composed of a whole variety of what's competitive in different countries. And that's the result of local taxation, local custom, local culture, um, and lots of different things. The best way that I uh, have been able to explain this, and it's a challenge getting senior leaders to understand this, is that it's not about the exchange rates. Um, I had, or at one point in my career, a conversation with an executive who said to me, well, we pay $80,000 for an analyst in the United States, and we need to hire somebody in the UK. The exchange rate's two to one, so therefore I need to pay 40,000 pounds for a similar person in the UK. And the fact is that that's not at all accurate. And at the time, you needed to pay someone in the UK to do the same job, something like 25,000 pounds. And um, they had a very different set of benefits. The tax structure is different. Um, and 25,000 pounds was fair and competitive pay for that job in the UK. So the, found, the first step is getting organizational leadership to understand that you don't set fair and competitive pay around the world through exchange rates. You have to look at locally competitive practice. Um, and that leads to identifying good sources of information uh, for locally competitive practice. Um, watching and working with organizations as they open locations in new countries around the world, you hire your first or your second employee and you kind of pay them whatever it takes because whether you're paying them too much and you're never paying too little, by the way, you're either paying fairly or too much, uh, yeah. competitively or too much. <laughs> I shouldn't say too much. You're paying more than competitively or you're paying competitively. Um, when you're hiring one or two people, the difference between spending $100,000 and $150,000 to get a new country off the ground doesn't make that much difference, frankly. So you pay $150,000 because you don't know your way around yet. You're still learning. Um, and then down the road, you get to five employees and you start to realize that maybe my compensation budget is more than needs to be to be competitive. And of course, we all know that if you over, you, I shouldn't say, let's say, let me say it this way, that you have to decide how you want to pay. Do you want to pay at market, above market, below market, based on your philosophy and strategy, the kind of employees you want to attract and retain, and how you want to position yourself in the market. But fundamentally, if you pay a lot more than your market competitors, your labor costs are much higher than theirs, and therefore you'll be less competitive as an organization, you'll be less profitable, assuming everything else is equal, right? Mm -hmm. and if you're much more profitable somewhere else, then it's probably worth it uh, to pay more for labor because you're making it up in other parts of your business. Um, but when you have one or two employees in a new country, you're not so worried about it. When you have 100 employees, it begins to become a big deal. Mm -hmm. So you really need to be able to identify sources, local sources for data on what's fair and competitive in that country. And the more that you look around, the more you realize that what I'm used to in my home country is very different from countries around the world. For example, and I know this is changing, but 15 or 20 years ago, if you were looking at fair and competitive pay in India, a huge proportion of the pay package was benefits. Yeah. And as much as 40% of the value that you delivered to employees was in various kinds of employee benefits and the tax structure there made it beneficial to deliver that much and maybe even more of the employee's remuneration of their total compensation package through different kinds of allowances 
and so on. So you need to go into these countries saying, you know, they may not do it the same way that I do it at home. I need to learn what the components of the total pay package are country by country, as well as what's competitive in terms of levels. To go back for a quick moment to Shard's question about fairness, um, we look at pay from two different perspectives. One is what's competitive, and that's a function of what happens in the market around me. What do other employers pay, and how do I want to be positioned relative to other employers? Do I want to be similar or more or less? Um, and there are reasons to take all of those different positions. And the other is how do I pay my fairness is the way, or equity is the way we think of it. And increasingly, you're seeing the conversation about pay equity and analyses of pay equity um, growing because there's increasing legislation or emphasis on legislation that requires pay equity, at least in the United States. Um, we're seeing a lot of that. And it's already been in place in many other countries around the world. And that goes to the um, questions that the woman you were talking with was asking. Um, how does her pay compare to other people that are similarly situated? And then it comes back to the point about why is the pay different? Is it a bona fide or reasonable legitimate difference? Yeah. You need to be able well, to explain that. Hey, you know what, uh, Zachary, I appreciate you bringing up this question because, and sometime you and I will just have to have a coffee, um, even if it's virtual. Um, but our company, because of legislation and and the rules of our world and the fact that in the medical industry, the rules are changing, changing every day. Um, and so I'm constantly trying to talk to my employees about the fact that the compensation model is gonna change. And we had to have what's called a fair market valuation with multiple laboratories. Mm -hmm. And so we are paid on a consistent basis, which requires a lot of work too. Um, also, we, we currently only have two laboratories. We used to have three, um, but it, it'd be fun for you to, to talk to my, my business partner. But um, our employees, like, so for example, after we met with Sam, we talked about, okay, owners get their pay, which we get paid less, but yet we get a distribution and we pay a lot of taxes which is another Oprah. And then, um, and then we have our director and our director of administration, and then we have our health advocates, right? And we've kind of like completely thrown up the Jenga in the air, as I call it. Okay. So I, because I have so much health background, HR, I, don't, I want their compensation to be very, very unique and very different. And I'm so proud of, of Sam because We've worked together for so long. So what I'm doing is, here's the number of widgets that you sell. Okay, products, okay? Because they are products. Mm -hmm. But I'm also building in, I have a graph now that talks about competency, uh, behaviors, talents, drives, and all that. And I'm blending that into what we call the talent management model. And it's very different than your typical um, performance management, HR, talent management processes. So, so I, I would recommend that as you're thinking about all these things, you not make them too complex. And it sounds like you're putting in lots and lots of components that are gonna make it very difficult to manage and, and, and understand. I wanted to mention something about differences in global compensation okay. structures oh. that you made me think of while you were talking. And that is here in the United States, we often see an interest in flattening hierarchy, mm -hmm. um, in reducing the number of levels, in looking at broad bands of pay and paying people within those bands. But there are many cultures where moving quickly through the pay cycle, getting promoted a lot is, is very important. Um, and those are things that you'll see. So for example, if you're building a global compensation structure or a global job structure, um, and then adding compensation components to it, and you're trying to look at how do we standardize the job families that we use around the world and the jobs that we have around the world so that we're all speaking the same language. Um, and then you begin to build pay structures into it, you may have 
10 pay levels for all of the different employees in the United States. But then you go to China or you go to India and there's an expectation on the part of employees that they're going to see a pay increase every six months. Yeah. Whereas here in the United States, it might be annual or it might even be every other year that you get a base pay increase. So you need to build structures that can overlap or integrate in ways that allow you to have that kind of flexibility as well. So while you are looking to build kind of standard or uniform parameters around the structure so that you can look at it consistently and executives around the world can speak to each other in the same language with regard to how the organization is structured from an employee hierarchy and, and, and a job architecture perspective, you still need to be able to have some flexibility in local pay structures. So it's not only in the amounts that you pay employees, but it's also in how often you consider pay increases and how you structure uh, those kinds of things. So it's about differences in both the mix, the components, the speed with which people move through the hierarchy. So there's mm -hmm. lots of important cult local cultural mm -hmm. considerations um, as you're thinking about global fair pay. Well, if I, if I may, and I'll, I'm sorry, Sam, I just need to say this. So Sam helped us out immensely, right? And we at, actually are going to evaluate our employees every six months. And based upon uh, Sam's guidelines, it is competent, you know, com, you know, com, or correct, you know, an analysis of everyone's pay. You know, we're also blending in the competency, the mm -hmm. The, the gift of their gifts and what they're good at. And also um, we're not using traditional corrective action processes, but when I fire them, usually my employees, my employees hug me. So I don't know why, um, because I'm fair with them. I tell them what's wrong with their problems. Um, but, but, you know, I would say we really need to revamp the perspective about a, uh, competency and full reward because it's not going to just be the performance of Ali and the conversation you have your, your boss with a couple of times a month. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sam, I'd like you to say what you want to say. No, no, I think that's a, a good point. I mean, you want to make sure that, you know, that when the competency process and, and when we're looking at pay, you know, and, and competencies, it's, it's a little bit different you know, as we're looking at competencies and particular jobs, we're, we're growing them through the job and maybe growing them through the, the pay structure and so forth. But, but what Zachary was, was mentioning earlier about the different types of hierarchies and companies, like for instance, the United States is, you know, likes, there's a lot of industries in the US that likes to be a little bit more flat and those that have uh, in other parts of the country or in other parts of the world that might more hierarchical. And I know that uh, uh, Zachary as the, as the US head of Gradar, you've experienced this a lot. I mean, as far as these different types of structures uh, job structures that are preferred across the globe. Now, I know that's one thing I really like about Gradar is it's a way that that uh, it gives us a lot of these different uh, levels that are consistent, and then you can map them differently to different different countries, right? For so you can have uh, twenty levels in in India and maybe just ten in the United States, and they and they link together. So so maybe you have culturally there's a, a desire to have greater uh, amounts of Promotions are with smaller increases in India, whereas in the U.S. you have that 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 one milestone promotion every couple of years, and it's a more significant. Uh, so, can you tell us about other aspects to where I mean that's that's an elements of the job when we look at at pay fairness. The, earlier, Nicole, you you, you mentioned uh, that there's different types of cultural preferences, uh, tax impacts and things like that need to, need to be considered. So where do uh, companies and leaders go to get this information? Okay, so <clears throat> there's a lot of different things in your comments and questions there, Sam. So let me just talk for a minute about Gradar because you mentioned that I am the <clears throat> manager of, of Gradar in the United States. Gradar is a soft, uh, software as a service compensation system that its foundation is job evaluation and it uses job evaluation to assist organizations in just about every aspect of job architecture. Mm -hmm. And what the job architecture, uh, what a comprehensive job architecture does for an organization is it gives it a framework that supports talent management because it can be used to look at career growth through the organization. 
It can, if competencies are tied into the job architecture, and Guerra can help you do that with the TMA competency library. Um, it gives you material that can be used for recruiting. It can give you material that can be used for performance management, material that can be used for employee development. So it's not only about pay, it's about all of those things that have to do with managing talent and helping people grow their career uh, with the organization. Um, so that's an important thing to think about. And you can use that and Gradar is designed to be consistent worldwide, but then we come back to those differences that Sam was talking about. Um, it's also flexible enough so that you can differentiate the pay structure. So, so interestingly, I think that a lot of the, the overall career management and talent management in the job architecture can be pretty consistent around the world. It's only when it comes to the pay itself and associated with that kind of the promotional hierarchy. So in some cultures, there's an expectation of frequent promotion. So you build it in, you know, you, you have it, let's just say your architecture has um, an associate account rep and an assistant account rep. So in a, in a culture that looks for more frequent changes in job title and or in pay levels, you create an associate account rep one, an associate account rep two, an associate account rep three, an assistant account rep one, an assistant account rep two, and so on. And that way you take what are two different jobs in a global architecture and you turn it into six different jobs um, to meet the local cultural expectations and needs. Right. Um, in terms of where do you get the information about what's culturally accepted, you have to reach out to uh, um, an, an expert like Sam or like me uh, to provide you with guidance. Uh, you, there's also a fair amount of information available if you just research job structures and so on in different countries around the world. At the end of the day, um, it will be necessary to find um, benchmark survey providers, companies that survey pay practices around the world and can provide you with that information. Um, and there are many local survey providers. There are a number of large global survey providers, uh, Willis Towers Watson, Mercer, Aon Hewitt are some of the global ones. Um, and, and then there are many local ones depending on where, on, on where you are. I know that I've been recently doing a project for a company in Connecticut, for example, and we're using a domestic survey by the Economic Research Institute, but we complemented it with data collected by the State Department of Labor. Mm -hmm. um, and between those two data sources, we got lots of good data for a manufacturing company in Connecticut. The same thing is true wherever you go in the world. You look for multiple data sources that can provide you information about market practices, and then you use that information to make decisions about uh, pay line. Do we want to pay? at the market on average? Do we wanna pay below market on average, above market on average? And then you build the pay structure, whether it's a pay range or a step system or all different kinds of approaches to delivering pay that is based on that market data um, and your organizational philosophy. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? It does, it does. And I have another one for you too. So, so the uh, uh, one of the, the common problems that, that uh, uh, leaders have when they're when they first start a multinational operation or even in in like when you I think that Shara is also is like if like when you when you were at uh, Banner and, and you have hospitals and that are maybe smaller in operations it's kind of similar but but as a global leader and you may be opening an office a small office in in a third world country and um, and then the when you say that, okay, we need to hire a vice president and, and you, you talk to the, to the local person in that, that particular company or that particular country, their idea of a vice president is, is, you know, they have their own frame set of what a vice president is and the level that is required. But I, one thing that uh, I think that, that is needed is, and I think that Gradar really helps with is, is really diving into the specifics to ensure that your that a vice president in uh, your home country is the same as the vice president and our level in a in another a different country in, by by scope. So, can you tell us a little bit about how Gradar helps with that? I know that 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 tool can really assist with 
ensuring there's consistency and leveling. Sure. So I think the question you're asking, Sam, highlights the fact that titles don't really convey a lot of information. Right. Um, and I'll give you two quick examples. The first is that if you are the CEO of General Motors, you're the CEO. And if you are the owner of mom and pop convenience store, mom is the CEO. Uh, but those aren't, they're not equivalent. Um, the other comes from my experience working in Latin America and Sam mentioned vice president. So in the United States, we typically think that the title hierarchy is manager, director, vice president. Um, when I was working in Latin America, I reported to the CEO and my title was director. I had five vice presidents reporting to me. So the way we think about these titles varies a lot locally and culturally. So to Sam's point, how does Gradar address that? It's by not focusing on the titles. It's by looking at the content of the jobs. It's by looking at factors in the jobs and the level that those factors exist in a range of factor categories that are important parts of determining the relative internal value of jobs. So job evaluation, and there are several approaches, and Gradar's approach is an analytic approach, which is systematized in a software as a service in an online platform, which is extraordinarily accessible um, and very objective um, if it's a, when it's applied consistently, looks at factors, compensable factors, and the factors that are chosen. And we'd, I'd be happy to talk about Gradar and give an opportunity right. or to anybody who's interested, um, but that have been tested and validated um, to be used to do this evaluation without a focus on the job title. It looks at those char job characteristics and values those characteristics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I find that as a, the most critical element to ensure that, that uh, the start with a level platform or, or to ensure that those jobs are leveled appropriately so you can start you know, paying them appropriately on a global basis. Right. So, yeah. But uh, real quick, just to jump back, because I, I also know that, that uh, uh, Gradar uh, inter does have interfaces with the TMA method and uses competencies. And so are, are, you know, are competencies looked as a similar across the globe and, and, and its utilization in Gradar? So the, the answer to that question is yes. And both TMA and other competency modeling organizations have done extensive research around the world and have found that there is a fair amount of consistency in the competencies that are expected and required to move to different levels of responsibility um, in an organization and in an organizational hierarchy. So the fact that um, you use a job architecture consistently around the world that while the title may be a little bit different uh, what's locally acceptable or expected um, might be different. The job responsibilities and the competencies associated with it are very well aligned around the world. That leads to a whole category of conversation that many um, multinational and international organizations have, and that's around titling. Um, and I've been through this exercise a number of times with different global organizations, and that is okay, we're trying to create a globally consistent job architecture so that we can think about the same job or this, and, and a job by job, I mean, set of duties and responsibilities similarly in countries around the world in terms of the organizational structure. Um, what do we do with the titles? Uh, and the answer has, in almost every case, the most successful answer has been to have kind of an internal company title and then a business or business card title so that the person in Latin America where your title is extraordinarily important, it's almost the most important part of your job sometimes, um, and you have traditionally been a vice president is the equivalent to a manager in the United States. And I might be exaggerating, but for the illustration, it makes sense. Your job title internal to the company in order for keeping track of where your job is in the architecture and the organizational hierarchy is manager. But you are authorized to use vice president on your, the door of your office and on your business card. So you can continue to present yourself um, as a vice president, even though internally the organization knows that 
the duties and responsibilities that you have are equivalent to a manager. And just to simplify that, the person is responsible for a country in Latin America, and there are 50 employees in that country, and they manage operations in that country. Um, but they're the vice president because they're one of the more senior employees. The equivalent employee in the United States has three times as many employees, um, but a slightly less complex organization because there's, there's more support. So those are seen as equivalent jobs, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but the titles that they use when they go and face the public um, are different. But internally, they're the same. Great. So, so Shara, do we have uh, some questions that, that came up? Yeah, we have we have a few questions. Um, I'm trying to figure out the the ones here, but uh, as a business owner, I just want to ask a couple questions, and then we'll get. Uh, Jules, can you just kind of look at the other questions, and then I can ask them my questions. Yeah, yeah. I saw you had your, your little blue hand. I didn't know if that was intentional, so I was like, okay, well, I don't know. usually use my little hand, but man. <laughs> on on the on the. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Ask the ways. But yeah, we will be wrapping up shortly, everyone. So if there are any last minute questions, just pop them in the chat and we'll get those answered for you. Okay. So Zachary, um, we have been in a very delicate situation because we took um, Sam Raven comp team's uh, feedback relative to compensation and total rewards. Um, our employees work part-time hours at full-time pay. And also they get full benefits, uh, really good be uh, medical benefits. So we just added, and we've added um, 401k and, and everything else. Um, so it's, it's, it's fascinating to me that even though we are offering all these benefits and we're offering really good pay, our, our entry level people that, like I told you, we want them to be like, unicorns like good salespeople plus medical people do, why would you think that twenty dollars an hour as a very fresh college graduate um at, 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 you know because we can't pay their internship right because there's there's challenges with the internships because it's basically taking a place of the actual job does that make sense yeah i understand what you're so, saying so so how would we attract um, like new medical students and and um, not have them thinking that $20 an hour sucks because we offer career career motivation and our employees actually make up to 100000 a year. Right. So um, I don't know a lot about your organization, Char, but from the little bit that we've been talking about, I think that the strategy of offering strong medical benefits for a medical services company makes a lot of sense. It's consistent. This is what we're about. So we do this for our employees. Right. Um, and that's part of the rationale for going in that kind of a direction. With regard to identifying unicorns, one of the reasons that they're called unicorns is that the combination of factors, the amount you're willing to pay and the skill set that you're looking for is very hard to find. I have a friend here in Rhode Island who runs an intellectual property law firm and he's looking for, he's always looking for unicorns. In fact, he's got a reputation for, to always be on the lookout for unicorns. The unicorns he's looking for are engineers and PhD um, scientists who want to study law and become IP attorneys. Um, and the problem right. that he's got is that he's willing to pay them as much as a lawyer makes even before they're a lawyer um, and he's willing to put them through law school uh, so wow. he's willing to pay them 80 or ninety thousand uh, dollars a year uh, but okay. an electrical engineer looks at him and says yeah but that's not enough because i can make 120 thousand uh, <laughs> by going into cybersecurity yeah. um, and working as an electrical engineer and in five years I may be making 150,000 working with you after I've gone to law school, but if I stay on the path that I'm on, I'll be making 200,000 as an electrical engineer. So the, the answer to your question is $20 an hour is not attractive to a medical student because no, they're thinking- No, uh, actually we have, we have uh, physician assistants and you know we don't really need a, a phys physician assistant. 
Right. I mean, they can have the qualifications of an MA or a receptionist. But I actually have uh, medical students to say they're, they're making more with us now than they would just getting into the medical field. And mm-hmm. the fact that we have all these great benefits, um, uh, it, it, it's like, we're all confused. We only need six people. Right. So <laughs> I, again, I'm not close enough to give you a comprehensive answer, but it sounds like I, in, in my experience as an entrepreneur, marketing is always the biggest um, challenge. <coughs> Excuse me. And in this case, that means helping people understand the value of the package that you're offering them. And one of the things that I have seen is that, and and counseled against, and it sounds like you're not doing this, so I don't need to counsel you against it, but is to give a package that is of competitive or more than competitive value, but is overweight on the benefits or the bonus or something like that, because well, people what do you don't about, know. What do you think about tuition assistance? That's same thing people i think that it's a great thing to add and it's a great thing to have and to to add on as a differentiator but people don't focus on that when they're comparing they only focus on the base pay Mm -hmm. um so if the people they're not thinking wow they're paying 20 dollars an hour but everything else is worth an additional 30 so it's like getting 50 dollars an hour they're not thinking about it that way so you have to help them think about it that way or you have to say you know what we're going to slim down some of these other things. And instead of offering 20, we're going to offer 30 and make the benefits worth 20 because we right. budgeted 50 as the amount that we can spend across the range of value that we're delivering. So we're, ta- um, we're talking like within the first uh, five to 10 shifts. And then within the first 60 months, they're going to get a substantial raise eloquent to their competencies and their abilities. Yeah, well, they're they're not understanding that, is my guess, because otherwise they'd be flocking to your door. Yeah, well, well, yeah. I think I think there's also the the current issue right now is that there's and this is and I was just talking to a gentleman from Australia yesterday, and it's a, a common phenomenon that that there's it's difficult to attract people to a lot of get people to come back into the office or get back to that's work. True after all of the, the assistance that's been going out. So, so it, it could be a piece of that, Char, as well, as just that it's difficult to find candidates right now just because of the uh, of this short-term shock that we're experiencing. I think well, the other I, thing I'm is- I'm expecting this maybe will end like in the next couple of months. Oh, I don't know. It, it but, may. So yeah. I, I, to Sam's point, some of it, and although, again, the research seems to show that Although I've spoken to lots of people who said my supplemental and employment benefits are greater than I can make working, so I don't want to work. But mm-hmm. I think that's more conventional wisdom and that the empirical data doesn't bear that out. It hasn't had a huge impact. Yeah. But I think that there is a lot of fear of coming back into the workplace and that that's still the case. So one of the th- challenges that I think a lot of employers are facing right now is if they're expecting people to come and work on site, lots of people are reluctant. Um, mm-hmm. And that makes it a bigger challenge as well. Well, we're doing everything in our power to provide sure. attractive benefits, and we are health advocates, so we don't right. get paid. Uh, we just get paid through the insurance companies. Okay, um, but I would tell you, even with hiring like big level recruiters, um, and I assume many of my my colleagues and business owners are also facing this problem because I happen to notice this. And so what I'm not- I I think we need to match up the, the data, compensation and recruiting, and we need to help paint a better picture about that. I would agree. That's what I meant by marketing. It's about how do you, what's the message that you're and how are you delivering it about the yeah. value of the whole package? And I would agree with you, Zachary, but I think we need like a compensation marketing program because I think even young millennials and whatever age you want to call us we're all looking at our futures financially how much we're saving how much we're providing for our families but I don't think that the HR and the executive teams and the compensation experts have really come together and and I would say now that postpartum uh well post you know COVID (laughs) Um, whatever I'll call it postpartum, Jules. Um, 
But anyway, we really have not come together and sat at the table because people, HR people are considered people, people. And, yeah. and I think sadly the HR people are struggling because they, they feel like they are not getting the, 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 the acknowledgement that we actually are smarter than you think when it comes to numbers. <laughs> we all, we're smart when it comes to numbers and when it comes to recruiting people for sure. If we're smart when it comes to giving our employees good benefits for sure. So I would suggest, can we get the, the, the financial people with the HR people and best benefits people to create a better attraction? Yeah, and coordinating, I think, is, is critical. But, but we, are, we are coming towards the top of the hour, so I do want to shift over really quick as we start thinking of some final questions for Zachary. So first of all, let me, let me uh, just go and uh, share my screen once more and, and acknowledge our sponsor, uh, the TMA method. So uh, TMA is a tool that, that uh, you can provide assessments uh, to your workforce to, to get to know them better. So know their work preferences, know their, their uh, strengths and their competencies, their drives and so forth. And as we learned with, with uh, Zachary, this is, is used by uh, some critical tools such as GradeR as well to help with uh, um, you know, understanding more of, of the career architecture stance and, and how to use competencies and the, the job profile and how that moves over to, to uh, uh, total rewards and compensation. So a very uh, uh, useful tool. If you'd like to learn more about that, I, I'm gonna go ahead and, and launch a, a quick poll that you can sign up if, you're, if you happen to be in our, uh, uh, in our, in our uh, Zoom platform. Otherwise, if you're on one of our other uh, multi, our streams, just go ahead and uh, shoot me an email at sam at compteam.net or just leave a comment in one of, of, of their, the uh, presentation that you're looking at there on that, uh, that stream. Uh, in addition, I'd like to also uh, uh, let everybody know of our next speaker, which is going to be Patty Money. She's going to be talking about the hybrid workforce and, and some of the issues that, that we're seeing there. So we've talked about some of those today. Uh, right now, there's, there's uh, as, as Char mentioned, it's, it's tough to find people to, to uh, come back to work and some of the candidate pool is, is, is thin. And so a lot of businesses are going to a hybrid model, meaning that there are some people that are full-time, there's some people that are uh, part-time in the office, and there's some people that are fully remote. So how do we uh, manage this new type of workforce in a, in a fair and equitable way? So a lot of things there. Great, so back to Zachary. Uh, so is there, is there any other questions that we're seeing, Jules, uh, for Zachary in the final Nothing's few minutes? Nothing's popped up. I, I guess everyone's just enjoying the conversation. Um, I think everyone's, yeah, just tuned in and um, yeah, I don't see anything last minute popping up here. Yeah. So, it, so Zachary, just a, a quick, as far as other trends that we were talking about, I mean, we, we've talked about several trends today, but is there anything in, that you're seeing that is uh, emerging that we haven't discussed in compensation related that is coming out of uh, uh, the pandemic? So I think one of the things that we're seeing in global, in the area of global pay are mobility changes. I think that more and more organizations are not sending people on long-term international assignments. They're sending, but they are sending more people on short-term assignments. Mm -hmm. So you're not seeing as many people that are being sent to international postings for a year or two or three, but you are seeing more people who are going for a month or two or three. Um, that's a big change. And that is much easier to manage in terms of global fair pay because in those cases you pretty much continue to pay the person whatever you pay them in their home country plus appropriate allowances for the costs associated with their assignment. Um, I would say that's probably a big trend that, that we're seeing. Is that coming out of the pandemic? Not so much. I think the biggest trend or the challenge, and you'll be talking about this more in the future and uh, next week and, and going into the future, um, are the challenges associated with how to pay people fairly when they are working remotely. Um, they have decided that they're going to go work on the beach in the Bahamas instead of in New York City. Um, and the cost of living in the Bahamas is very different than the cost of living in New York City. And that's a critical component in determining fair pay. Right. Um, organizations are struggling with that now. 
How do you manage the taxes? States are starting to go after each other. Wow, this person works for a company in New York, but they live in Boulder. Um, you know, how, how do we manage that? How does New York get the taxes it wants and Colorado get the taxes it wants uh, to make everything work? I think those are some of the things we're seeing going forward. Great. Uh, some good uh, uh, thoughts for future topics on the forum and, and the, the rewards mastermind. So I think uh, more to come there. All right. Well, thank you so much, Zachary, for your time today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. My pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. And I'm going to research you. Yes. <laughs> I left the website for everyone. So um, if you scroll up in the chat, I've left the link. So go check it out. Get in touch with Zachary. Um, I checked the website out, website out last night and there was a lot of great info. So definitely get on it and um, get in touch with him if, if it uh, sparks your interest. To Jules's point, if you want to learn about compensation, there is so much information on the Greater website that I consistently tell people there's a course in, in Compensation 101 is available just in the materials on the Greater website. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Beautiful. Why, why wouldn't you jump on that? Like, so yeah, again, the it. link is up <laughs> there. So yeah, click. we appreciate you. If we have more time, I, I can imagine what we can learn from you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Zachary. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Yeah, right. you have, have a great week. Bye.